أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لا تلك آيات الكتاب المبين إنا أنزلناه قرآنا عربيا لعلكم لعلكم تعقلون نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن وإن كنت من قبله لمن الغافلين إذ قال يوسف لأبيه يا أبت إني رأيت أحد عشر كوكبا إني رأيت أحد عشر كوكبا والشمس والقمر والشمس والقمر رأيتهم لي ساجدين قال يا بني لا تقصص رؤياك على إخوانك وَأَدِّكَ فَيَكِيدُ لَكَ كَيْدًا فَيَكِيدُ لَكَ كَيْدًا إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لِلْإِنْسَانِ عَدُوٌّ الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The greatest and the most epic of all stories in the Quran أحسن القصص The story and the surah that was revealed about the Prophet Yusuf This surah was revealed Many don't know but according to many scholars, this surah was revealed in the saddest year of the Prophet ﷺ's life. The year in which his wife passed away and his uncle passed away. His two greatest sources of help, of moral support, of financial support, they passed away. He had nothing. He was feeling the despair, feeling the difficulty, feeling the challenges of this time. And in order to reassure him, Allah revealed this surah. The best of all stories. This surah has six chapters. And in this short session today, before Isha Salah, we are going to take a tour of this surah and a tour of these six chapters, the six stages of the life of Yusuf. The first stage of the story is the dream. Yusuf sees a dream. And in this dream, he sees 11 stars and the sun and the moon doing sujood prostrating to these stars. 
This dream he sees is so unusual, but it's so vivid, it's so graphic, it's so clear in his mind. Something doesn't feel right. But he has such a close relationship with his father, he is open enough to tell him this secret. And the conversation between father and son is such a loving conversation, you can see there is a strong relationship already. He addresses his father saying, Ya abati inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaba. Abati, not abi. Abati in the Arabic language is a loving, endearing way to address your father. Not like dad. Like Abuji, Baba, Habibi. It's a, it's a loving way to, to address your father. So he had a very close relationship with his father. Close enough that he was willing to share a dream with his father. But his father teaches him something very important. Ya bunayya la taqsus ru'yaka ala ikhwatika fayakidu laka kayda. My son, ya bunayya, my beloved small child. Don't share this story with your brothers because they will plot against you. In today's world, we live in the age where before you experience something, you have to share it. Somebody goes to Umrah. They waited their whole life. They saved money, time, 20, 30 years until this moment where they could see the house of Allah. And the moment they come in front of the house of Allah, what's the first thing they want to do? They want to take a picture, a video. Look at me, I'm in front of the Kaaba. They ruined the moment. This moment, you will never experience it in again in your whole life. The moment, the first time you look at the Kaaba. And you wanted to ruin this moment by taking a picture of the Kaaba. We are the generation of oversharing. We want to share before we have experienced something. Somebody gets married. Before he enters the hotel or before he enters the private quarters with his wife, he wants to take a picture of them holding hands and put it on the internet. You haven't even sat with her yet. What is Yaqub saying to his son? لا تقصص رؤياك Don't, تقصص literally means don't put it on your stories. You don't have to share it. Not everything needs to be shared because you don't know who's watching. You post something on social media. Some people watching you are saying, MashaAllah, that looks like a nice dessert. MashaAllah, that's a nice holiday destination. Other people are watching you thinking, I wish this person, I wish this was taken away from this person and given to me. When you don't know who is watching what you do, with what mindset, with what intention, then why do we share so much? So much of our personal lives are now open for everybody to see. But the story of ya the, the advice of Yaqub rings true. Not everything should be shared because we don't know who is waiting to listen. The Prophet used to advise people to hide their blessings. Istainu ala qadai hawa'ijikum bil kitman. Don't let everybody know I have this wealth, I have this property, I have this blessing, I have this spouse. People don't need to know. But we've come to a point where unless we share it, we don't feel like we truly... We cannot digest the food until we took a picture of it and shared it with somebody. It doesn't digest properly. Because we are now so used to sharing. The first lesson from the dream of Yusuf salam, not everything needs to be shared. When we share things on social media, we're sharing it with people who are not related to us. Yaqub is saying to Yusuf, your own brothers don't share it with your own blood brothers because they are already jealous of you and you will fan the flames. How many jealous people are there on the internet? Only Allah knows. They're not even related to us and yet we give them the privilege of having access to our private lives. This is the first lesson from the dream of Yusuf alayhi salam. The brothers of Yusuf begin to plot. And we come to the second stage in his life. The first stage is the dream. The second stage is the well. Yusuf's brothers begin to plan. Our father loves Yusuf alayhi salam more than us, even though we are a tight group, a strong group of boys. 
He loves Yusuf and his brother more than us. Does anybody know what's the difference between Yusuf and his brother, Binyamin, and all the other brothers? What's the difference between them? Uh -huh. Ah, they're brothers from the same father but from a different mother. So these ten brothers are from one mother, and these two, Yusuf and Binyamin, are from another mother. And so the ten brothers feel they get this perception our father prefers Yusuf over us. Even though we are such a strong group of guys, he should be loving us more. Inna abana lafi dalalim mubin. Our father is completely lost. Who are they describing? They are describing a prophet of Allah. Why? Because when you feel, you and me, when we feel somebody is wrong, it doesn't matter who they are, what is the explanation, what is the evidence, we're not interested. When we want something from somebody, that's all we want. We're not interested, why does it seem like they're interested in something else? Why have they made this decision? We're not interested. We want to blame them. Inna abana lafi dalalim mubin. What's the next step? اقتلوا يوسف أو اطرحوه أرضا يخل لكم وجه, وجه أبيكم Kill Yusuf or throw him in an unknown land so that your father's attention can solely be given to you. What do children want? They want attention. Sometimes they make tantrums. Sometimes they fight. Sometimes they make loud noises. And all this time they just want attention. Today, the average parent can only give their child 20 minutes of one-to-one -one time. The average parent only gives their child 20 minutes of one-to-one -one time. These children, our children today, are starved of attention. They don't get enough attention, enough quality time with us as parents. Yusuf Islam's brothers, they get so much attention from their father, yet they say, we need more attention from him. By nature, human beings seek attention. And social media only makes it worse because now rather than getting attention from your father, you have it from 30 other people. And we seek this drive, this need for people's attention, people's eyes to be on me. This need is a very dangerous need. It can cause you to kill someone. It can cause you to oppress somebody. It can cause you to wrong someone because they're getting more attention than you. So they make this intention, we are going to get rid of Yusuf. وَتَكُونُوا مِن بَعْدِهِ قَوْمًا صَالِحِينَ And after we kill Yusuf السلام, we will become righteous. Does anybody know what this means? After we kill Yusuf, we will become righteous. What does that mean, we will become righteous? We will do tawbah later on. We will kill Yusuf, then later we will come and say, Oh Allah, just forgive us please, you know. How many of us engage in the same deed? We know we're going to do something wrong, but we say, it's okay, later Allah is Rahim, He's going to forgive us. We play, we play a game with Allah. They were playing a game with Allah. We're going to do something, we know it's wrong, but later Allah will forgive us. One time I walked into a shop, off-license store. I saw uncle standing at the cashier with a hat. SubhanAllah, I don't even have a hat, I'm sitting here. He had a hat, and he was standing in front of a row of alcohol bottles. I said, uncle, what is this? He said, it's okay. Once I make my millions, I will ask Allah to forgive me. All of us do this. We can laugh at uncle, but we all do this to some extent. All of us, we pretend to Allah like we don't know what we're doing, but we are planning, we are planning to do something wrong, and we're planning later on we'll come back to him. But sometimes the later on never comes. Sometimes that later, that we postpone, I'll become righteous later. I will stop this habit later. I have to move to this country, then I'm going to become, I need to do hijrah, then. There is no ideal conditions to return to Allah. The time is now. But this procrastination, this postponing of returning to Allah, even the brothers of Yusuf, they were employing the same trick. They take Yusuf alayhi they tell a story to their father. They throw him in a well. And when they throw him in a well, 
they leave him, they abandon him, hoping he's going to die and rot in that well. It is at this moment in time, this small boy, six to seven years old, imagine he's in a dark well, separated from his father. His brothers have wrestled him to the ground and chucked him in this dark well. He's sitting there, what is he thinking? What's going to happen to me? In this moment of darkness and confusion, this young child, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to him. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِ لَتُنَبِّئَنَّهُمْ بِأَمْرِهِمْ هَذَا وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ Allah promises him, Yusuf, one day, you are going to stand and tell them about what happened, and they have no clue. This is the promise of Allah. Allah is promising Yusuf. But in this moment, inside the well, does it sound like that's possible? It's realistic for him to survive this situation? It's not realistic. It's not possible. It's not practical. But because Allah promised him, he holds on to the promise of Allah. Allah promised him, one day you will come out. One day you will grow. One day you will stand in front of them and you will tell them the story. He trusts the promise of Allah. Many times in our life, we find ourselves in a dark hole. Maybe not the same physical dark hole. You're in a financial situation. You're in a tough marriage. You're struggling with work. You're struggling with, your, with a family member. You're struggling to pray your salah. Somebody's oppressing you. Somebody's giving you a difficult time. In this dark hole, you think, there's no way I'm coming out of this dark hole. The other day, somebody came to me. They had failed an exam. Eight years they had been preparing for this exam, now they failed the exam. And there's no reset, there's no retake. Eight years they had been preparing to become a pharmacist, and now they can never be a pharmacist. They sat down in front of me, they said, I am in such a dark hole, there is no way for me to come out. This, when you reach this point, the point of no return, you're broken. There's no way, no way to go. I don't know where I'm going to go from here. This is the point in which you need to hear from Allah. When Yusuf is in the world, he needs to hear from Allah. Allah speaks to him. Then he's happy, he's awake, he's reassured because he heard the speech of Allah. Similarly, when you find yourself in this hole and you see there's no way out, where, how am I going to come out from this hole? You need to hear the words of Allah. There is nothing that can pick you up when you are down, that can mend you when you are broken, that can repair your heart when it is destroyed, except the words of Allah. The words of Allah are the light in the darkness. The words of Allah gives you hope when you have given up. The words of Allah give you happiness when you have reached a point of sadness. This is what Yusuf needed to hear when he was in the well. Now we come to the third stage of his story. The dream, number one. Then what was the second? The well. And number three, the palace. How does this boy go from the dark well to a luscious, luxurious palace? How does this happen? He doesn't know how it's going to happen. They sold him. وَجَاءَتْ سَيَّارَةٌ فَأَرْسَلُوا وَارِدَهُمْ فَأَدْلَى دَلْوَهَا A caravan is passing by. They're thirsty, so they come to drink water. They see a young boy sitting inside the ditch. قَالَ يَا بُشْرَى هَذَا غُلَامٌ Wow, I found a young boy. But a young boy in those days, it was not a good thing. He was going to be taken as property to be sold in the slave markets of Egypt. They took him as a piece of property, as an item, as a commodity. They didn't see him as a human being. How can we help this child? No, they saw him. When they looked at him, they had dollar signs in their eyes. How can we make money out of this kid? So this boy... Some murderers just left him and some money makers just picked him up. At this point, he should be losing hope. But no, he trusts. Allah is going to show him the way. He knows Allah has a plan for him. 
He reaches the markets of Egypt. This man is this young man is a prophet of Allah. His value with Allah is so high. But when people come to assess him, they say, Look at this kid, he's so thin, skinny. He's not been fed. No biceps. How is he gonna lift? How is he gonna clean? How is he gonna serve? How is he gonna milk the cows? No, no. I cannot pay more than five dollars for this kid. Five pounds. I need a discount. This child is not valuable to me. This is what was being said in the markets of Egypt. They didn't value Yusuf alayhisalam. They thought this guy is cheap. He's not, there's nothing he can offer us. But did this reduce the spirits of Yusuf? Did this destroy his self-esteem? Did this destroy his strength? No, it didn't. Why? Even though people were not willing to pay pennies to purchase this child, why did he still have his self-esteem, his strength, his iman intact? It's a real question. I'm not going to answer the question. Yusuf salam was bought in the market of Egypt for a very cheap price. But how come, despite that, he still had held his head high? Allah promised him, more, I need more than this. Okay, he said he has a strong faith in Allah. Anybody else? Allah made him an ayah. Today, when somebody looks at you, they put a certain value. This guy is a small guy, not very important. Or this person is a not very important person. Based on your wealth, based on your status, based on your postcode, based on your followers, people look at you, they judge you. This person is nobody. This is what they did to Yusuf a.s. They judged him based on his appearance. But deep down he knows Is my value Am I waiting for this guy to come and tell me How valuable I am Where does he get his value from Gets the value from Allah They may have thought little of him But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Held him in high esteem Today we are very often We are at the mercy of people We want to please people In Urdu they say what will the people say? As they say in the Arabic language, you can never please everybody. But we are constantly thinking, what will they say? If I buy that car, if my wedding is held in that hall, if I am this, if I, walk, if I work that job, how will the people perceive me? What status will they assign to me? High status, low status? Should I drive a Mercedes or a Yaris? If I drive the Yaris, I can afford it. But then people will look at me, they will say, look at this guy. If I drive the Mercedes, they'll look at me with a different eye. If I support Liverpool, they'll look at me in a certain way. If I support Man United, they'll look at me another way. We are always in our minds weighing what will people say about us. But really, what we learn from this part of Yusuf Alayhisalam's life, he is not bothered about what people think about him. He is wondering, what does my Lord think about me? Ridwan Nasi can never please everybody. He reaches the palace. To get to the palace, he had to be abused at the hands of these people in the market. Sometimes you have to go through a very dark hole to come out into the light. He goes into the palace. And he goes into the palace and he finds a very merciful, a very generous king, a very generous leader takes him under his wing. And this king says to his wife, look after this young boy. وَقَالَ الَّذِي اشْتَرَاهُ مِن مِصْرَ لِمْرَأَتِهِ أَكْرِمِي مَثْوَاهُ أَكْرِمِي مَثْوَاهُ عَسَىٰ أَن يَنفَعَنَا أَوْ نَتَّخِذَهُ وَلَدًا He says to his wife, look after him. Maybe he will benefit us or maybe we can take him as a child. Can somebody tell me? Somewhere else in the Quran, somebody else said the same sentence about another young boy. 
What did Fir'aun say? Ah, can anybody give me the ayah? Huh? What did Fir'aun say when Musa came to the palace? Asa. Maybe we can take him as a son. There are a lot of actually a lot of links between Musa and Yusuf in the Quran. Musa alayhi salam is from which, which people? Banu Israel, the sons of Israel. Is there another name for Israel? Yaqub. Yaqub alayhi salam, another name for Yaqub is Israel. So Yusuf alayhi salam is literally the son of Israel. He is also Banu Israel. They are both Banu Israel. They are both far from their families. They are both end up in a palace. And both of them, when they enter the palace, it is said, Asa and Yanfa'ana, aw natakhidahu walada. Maybe, maybe he can be a son. Maybe we can take him and look after him and love him and maybe he'll become a son for us. So these, the king and the queen, Zulaikha and her husband in Egypt, for a long time, Allah did not provide them with a son. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided them with Yusuf alayhi salam. And they thought, look at this child. Maybe he can be like a son to us. So they decided to love him like a parent loves him. Now this was a wisdom from Allah's wisdom. Now see, Yusuf alayhi salam is far from his father and his mother. But he's taken into a house where they are not looking at Yusuf as an employee, they are looking at him and they're saying, this, this might be our child. Let us treat him like a father and mother treat a child. So Yusuf salam didn't get the treatment of an employee, he got the treatment of a, of a beloved son. And this is how Allah provides him the thing he was missing. He was missing his father, Allah provided him somebody else. This is why we learn a very important principle from this phase in Yusuf's life, the palace. If Allah takes away something from you, guaranteed He is going to give you something better. If Allah takes something from you, guaranteed He is going to give you something. Okay, tell me, what did Allah take from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? What did Allah take away from Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Yes. Okay, his parents were taken away. His father. What else? Yes. Hmm? His sons. His children passed away. What else? Huh? His wife and uncle passed away. What else? Hmm? His wife passed away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at this. this. Is this not the most beloved person to Allah on this earth? This is the most. Allah loves this man more than anybody in this room, right? And yet Allah took away his mother and his father and his grandfather and his uncle and his wife and his sons. What's left? What's left for him? Allah. He who has no one, the only thing they have, the only one they have is, is Allah. That's why Allah says, وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى Oh, Muhammad وسلم, didn't you I find you poor and I enriched you. The Prophet وسلم, is a yateen. So who nurtures the Prophet? Who looks after him? Allah. He replaces his father, brother, sister, cousin, children, he replaces them with the Creator. The Prophet وسلم, so Umm Salama anha, one of the Prophet's companions, Umm Salama. Her husband passes away. She comes crying to the Prophet ﷺ. They were married for decades. Her husband passes away. She says to the Prophet ﷺ, What do I say in this sadness? He says, Allahumma ajirni fi musibati wa khlufli khayram minha. Oh Allah, reward me for my difficulty and give me something better. Huh? Can you give her someone better than Abu Salama? Abu Salama was one of the loveliest husbands from the companions. You can't replace him. So she said, Allahumma ajirni fi musibati wa khlufli khayran minha. A few days later, who proposed to her? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah took away her husband and gave her the best husband in the world. Yusuf alayhi gave him new parents. 
He lost his wealth and Allah gave him new wealth. When Allah takes something away from you, if you have Iman, He is going to give you something better. He's in the palace. Now don't think that being wealthy and having status is just a blessing from Allah and enjoyment. No, it comes with its own test. People think being poor is a test. No, my friends. Being rich is a worse test because you don't realize what's coming. Yusuf السلام, is in the palace. What is the biggest test he gets in the palace of Egypt? Women. That's his biggest test. The temptation of women. The wife of this king locks the doors, locks him in a room and says, come here. Now a beautiful woman from a beautiful family, the queen of the country, she wants this young man. Any other young man would have ran at the opportunity. But he ran in the opposite direction. He says, how can I fall into this sin with you when my Lord has looked after me so well? At every moment in our life, there's a temptation. Something is there to tempt us. It could be women, it could be men, it could be wealth, it could be job opportunity, it could be anything. And in this moment, this is the thing, this is the moment that will test. Are we in fear of people or are we in fear of Allah? You know, many parents, they make this mistake. They think, I have to scream and hit and beat and shout at my kids because they need to fear me. You know what happens then? When dad is not around, mom is not around, then what are the kids doing? They're doing everything they want. Because who did they fear? Mom and dad. The greatest thing Yaqub did for Yusuf, he instilled in him not the fear of Yaqub, the fear of Allah. What's the last word Yaqub said to Yusuf? Who can tell me? The last sentence father says to son before before his son disappears for 50 years, what's the last sentence he says to his son? In the shaytan al insani adubu mubin. Continue. Wa kadalika. Wa yutimma. Al yaqub. Mm-hmm. Ah, this is the last sentence. Inna rabbaka alimun hakim. The last sentence Yaqub says to his son, Allah is alim, he knows everything, and Allah is hakim, he's the most wise. From this point, he never sees his son for 40 years. This sentence is ringing in the head of Yusuf. Inna rabbaka alimun hakim. Inna rabbaka my Lord is watching me. Allah is going to look after me. Allah is the most wise. This is the, the parenting skills of Yaqub. He doesn't fill his son with the fear of Yaqub. He fills his son with the fear and the love and the hope and the reassurance that Allah is with him. So when Yusuf is in the well, he remembers Allah. And when he's in the palace, he's remembering Allah. This is how what we have to do for our kids. We have to nurture them to be conscious of Allah. This is what will help them when they get locked in the room. Yusuf gets locked in the room with this woman. And the first thing that escapes his lips, قَالَ مَعَاذَ اللَّهِ Allah's name comes out of his mouth, straight away. This is somebody who is always remembering Allah. If you are always remembering Allah, when the test comes, you will remember Allah straight away. Many people think they are going to die upon La ilaha illallah. Many people. But when you get in a car accident, you're on the M6, you're on the M62, you're on the M606, you're the M1, you're driving, and you get in a near car accident, what word escapes your lips? We hope it's Ya Allah. For some people, the word starts with F. Sometimes it starts with B, S, <laughs> yes. Huh? Oh my God. 
the kuffar, yes, the kuffar sometimes, you know, yes, even a disbeliever in an unbeliever, people of no faith, people of other faiths, when they are in, almost in a car accident, they might say, oh God. That word that escapes your lips in that moment, you could have died in that moment and that would have been the last words you said. So what is that word? If your whole life you are used to saying La ilaha illallah when you slip, when you trip, when you stand, when you sit, you will die upon La ilaha illallah. But if when you slip and you trip and you fall and you get hurt and something happens, something shocks you, something with F escapes your lips, that's the word you will die upon. Man shabba ala shay'in shabba alayhi. You, you get used to doing something, you will die upon that thing. So Yusuf alayhi salam, when the temptation strikes, he remembers Allah. Allah. Now, the first dua Yusuf alayhi salam makes is in this phase, the palace. It's a very strange dua. I guarantee nobody in this room ever made a dua like this. Anybody can tell me what's the dua? La this at the end. Now in the in the palace. Who can tell me the dua of Yusuf? Qala Rabbi sijnu ahabu ilayya min ma yadunani ilay. Oh Allah, prison is more beloved to me than what these women are offering me. Oh Allah, send me to prison. Nobody here has made a dua like this in their life. What do we learn from this dua? He is sitting in an air-conditioned palace in Egypt. It's a very hot country. For those who don't know, try to go in a microbus in Egypt. You'll find out in Madinat Nasr. It's very hot. He's sitting in a very beautiful, open, fanned palace. Comfortable. And he's making dua. Oh Allah, please send me to prison. I would rather be in prison than be in here. This dua. What do we learn from this dua of Yusuf? Allah hmm. Akbar. We learn from Yusuf alayhi salam. He would rather be in prison or be obeying Allah than be in the palace. Tempted to disobey Allah. Many of us, we have such decisions in life. We get two job offers. One in an investment bank, one in an unknown company. But we know one is more halal than the other. And usually the more halal one will have a lower pay. <laughs> will, will have a lower offer, lower package. Think. We get two proposals. One brother who's this and one brother who's... And the brother who's religious is usually is not as well off as the other. We have two decisions. We come at many times in our life, we come at a crossroads. We have to make a call, make a decision, a hard decision. Yusuf alayhi salam, he makes a decision. He says, oh Allah, send me to prison. Nobody would have done that. But he knows in prison, there is no fitna to his deen. Nothing is going to test his deen. It will test his dunya. He will struggle, he will be paining, he will be sleeping on the floor, he knows. But at least his relationship with Allah is going to be fine. He would rather that test. This is why one of the du'as of the Prophet Sallallahu Allahumma la taftinna fi deenina. Oh Allah, don't test me in my deen, in my relationship to you. Don't test me in this. Test me in everything else, but not in this. He chooses the prison. And now we enter the fourth chapter of the life of Yusuf alayhi salam. The prison. So we said the dream. And then... The well, and then the palace, and now, now he reached the prison. Can you see what is this journey? Until he reaches the prison. When he is in the prison, Yusuf alayhi salam, two men come to him. Two non-Muslim men come to Yusuf in a non-Muslim country in a prison, and they say, "Inna naraka min al Yusuf, we have been watching you. You are from the Muhsineen. What does this mean, Muhsineen? Who can tell me? Top. More than Iman. Top. Yes, it's more than Iman. It's somebody who is... Their behavior is beautiful to watch. Their character is just amazing to watch. Polite, humble, kind, gentle, patient, helpful. What can you imagine? What does it mean for a non-Muslim is watching Yusuf alayhi salam? Why would he say he is a muhsin? Is it because Yusuf is praying salah, making dua, 
his behavior because a non-Muslim doesn't value those things. His behavior to other people was exceptional. You go into a store to get customer service. You go to a supermarket. You go to the Muslim working in the supermarket. Where's the baked beans? Dabbar Amrak, I don't know. Go, aisle seven. You go to the non-Muslim, where's the baked beans? He walks with you to aisle seven. Picks the tin out of the aisle, puts it in your trolley. Have a lovely day, sir. This is inna naraka min al-muhsineen. We have got it wrong. We think ihsan is only about salah and zakah. If you are living in the UK, you have an obligation. We are representing Islam to everybody outside the masjid. What, how good are we doing at this job? What kind of a job are we doing? If people have the perception that if you deal with a Muslim, in any setting, the Muslim is going to be the one, their postcode will be polluted, their neighborhood will be bad, they will be loud, they will not be punctual, they will be rude. If this is people's perception, we have failed. We have to change this perception. In a non-Muslim prison, a bunch of non-Muslims, they are watching Yusuf, and what do they say? Amazing guy. So helpful, so kind, so gentle. This is a very important principle in da'wah. People think what I am doing is da'wah, to sit and give a speech. Yusuf Alayhisam teaches us a very important principle. Give da'wah, invite people to Islam with your behavior without even saying a word. Invite people to Islam with your, with your behavior, with your akhlaq, with your manners. People at work, if you work with non... Who here, who can put their hands up? Who here works with majority non-Muslims as your colleagues at work? If you work and the majority of your colleagues are not Muslims, put your hand up. At work, all of them should be able to say, you know, the best guy in this, the best person in this company, in this department, is that Muslim guy. Because he's a Muslim, he's always on time. He's a Muslim, he's always exceptional in his work. He goes for salah, he comes back, he's so smiling, polite, kind, well-mannered to everybody. Amazing. This is the same as inna naraka min al-muhsin. Now Yusuf alayhi salam, they come to him and what are they asking him? They want him to interpret the dream, their dream. How much time do we have left? 13 minutes, good, enough time. May Allah put barakah in 13 minutes. They want Yusuf alayhi salam to interpret their dream. Now this dream interpretation, this is a service Yusuf alayhi salam is providing for free. This is a very important thing to learn. If you want to be effective in calling non-Muslims to Islam, one of the things we learn from Yusuf alayhi salam is provide free services to them. Open a soup kitchen for the homeless. Open free legal advice. Muslims giving legal advice. Open a free GCSE tuition, free mentoring scheme. A free service which non-Muslims want to come and benefit from. This is what Yusuf is doing. In the prison, he's interpreting people's dreams as a free service. They come, they say, we want some of this as well. Now, look at the trick. He says, great. You asked me for dream interpretation. I'm going to serve you some food. Hospitality. قَالَ لَا يَأْتِيكُمَا طَعَامٌ تُرْزَقَانِهِ إِلَّا نَبَّأْتُكُمَا بِتَأْوِيلِهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَأْتِيَكُمَا Oh, you want me to interpret your dream? Come sit, let, let's eat some food together. Who over here lives with, next to a non-Muslim neighbor? Put your hand up. You have a non-Muslim neighbor. Okay. How many, how many of us have invited our neighbor for tea? Only one, two. MashaAllah, three, four, five. We can do more. Yusuf salam says, come eat food with us. You know, one of the most delicious fascinations of non-Muslims is our food. Whether it's mandi or butter chicken. Yes? Bring them, come sit. You're my neighbor, come have a meal with us. Before the food comes, he says, I'm going to tell you my story. How I came here to this prison in Egypt, I'll tell you how I got here. 
He starts to tell them, you know, my grandparents, Ibrahim, Ishaq, Yaqub, these are my grandparents. When the food comes, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you the service I promised you. I'll interpret your dream when the food comes. Until then, let me tell you my story. I come from this place, my father, Yaqub, etc., etc., etc. He's telling them the story. And they're listening to this story. It's a very interesting story. And in the middle of this story of his life, how he got to prison, suddenly he says, Ya sahibai sijni a'arbaabun mutafarriqoon My friends, does it make sense to have multiple gods? Amillahu al-wahidu al-qahar Or does it make more sense to have one powerful creator? Guys, tell me, what makes sense? You see, he slips it in. He gives them a free service. He gives them free food. And while he's telling them the story of his life, he puts the message of Tawheed in the sandwich. And when they say, wow, you're so amazing at this dream interpretation, very specialist knowledge, you're so intelligent. My God taught me this, you know. I don't have this knowledge from myself. My Lord taught it to me. Everything he speaks to them, he links back to Allah. This is da'wah. This is how you will bring them in. This is how you will introduce Islam to them. By being a good neighbor. By feeding them. By offering services. Being useful to our community. And then when they see us as useful, as productive, as contributors to society, they will say, what is this deen? I want to join. Tell me, what is this deen? I'm happy to join. But what we do with the flyers, you know, when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your house and they put the Bible flyers in, you get very annoyed, right? It's not very exciting. That's what we do. We have stolen this tactic. Goes throw the flyers in people's doors. The method of Yusuf alayhi salam is if you want to introduce Islam to a non-Muslim society, you have to offer them a free service. You have to have beautiful character. You have to invite them for food and then you pass the message. This is the method of Yusuf And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Because of his ihsan Despite being in the prison This is another important lesson Never submit to your circumstance People say I'm stuck I'm an orphan I have no money I have this So you know because of this I'm a very bitter person I have a bad temper Because my parents They hit me when I was young I am like this because of this that happened to me. Yusuf is not giving himself any excuses. He can say, I'm in a prison, so I'm a very aggressive man. I'm a very violent man. I'm really sorry, guys. No. Despite being in the worst place on earth, the dungeons of Egypt, he shows beautiful character. He doesn't let his environment be an excuse. He instead twists the environment to make it in his favor. This skill that Allah gave him to interpret dreams returns him back to the palace. He returns back to the palace and he explains to the king the meaning of this dream. And we reach the final chapter of this story when the dream comes true. So we said, the dream, the well, the palace, the prison. And now we're going to come to the dream comes true. The last stage of this story. Yusuf alayhi salam he says to the king, Make me in charge of the agriculture of this country because I am knowledgeable and trustworthy. This is how you make a job application. You have to show you are knowledgeable, but you also have to show you have good character, you are trustworthy. This is how Yusuf alayhi salam, Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ مَكَّنَّا لِيُوسُفَ فِي الْأَرْضِ We gave Yusuf alayhi salam strength, power, wealth and influence. Many Muslim think, Muslims think becoming wealthy and becoming influential is a bad thing. That's not true. Yusuf alayhi salam, the king says, come, what do you want to do for me? Yusuf doesn't say, look, you see the walls? I'll paint the walls every day. Just give me, I'll, I will drive you to and from, I'll do some taxi driving. No. 
Yusuf alayhi salam says, I want to be the boss. Give me control of everything in the land. Yusuf alayhi salam is? How would you describe him? He's ambitious. He aims high. He doesn't aim low. Yeah, I will just lay the bricks and khalas. Mawlana. No, I want to control everything in this land. Why? For the sake of Allah. Inni hafidun alim. I have skills and I am trustworthy. Make me in charge. Similarly, for us as Muslims, we should not be satisfied in the dunya with lowness. We should always aspire, have ambition, to have wealth, to have influence, so we can use it for the sake of Allah. How much money was spent to build this masjid? One point? Huh? 1.7 million pounds. In order to build this masjid, what do we need? We need money. How many other masajid require building? Where is the money going to come from if we are happy with playing the lowest role in society? Yusuf alayhi salam aims high. I want to be in control of all of this land. Inni hafizun alim. And this comes from Allah. This ambition to use his wealth, his skills for the sake of Allah. There are three C's that Yusuf alayhi salam has. I want you to remember three C's. The first, Yusuf alayhi salam is competent. Meaning, he is good at what he does. If he is bad at what he does, will he become the head of the economy in Egypt? No, of course not. Number two, he is confident. Yusuf alayhi salam, he has a skill. He is not hiding at home and saying, Khalas, I'll keep my skill to myself. No, he's saying, I want to be the leader. Make me in charge. I want to take control of the land. He is confident. And the third C, he has character. He is not just taking wealth and influence so that he can spend it on himself. He has a belief, firm belief in Allah. He's going to use this for the sake of Allah. After this, he confronts his brothers. His brothers come to him. His brothers realize after a long back and forth and going to Egypt and returning back, they realize that this man is Yusuf. Are you really Yusuf? They're shocked. What are they expecting from Yusuf After 40 years of being away from his parents and they tried to murder him, what are they expecting from him? Hmm? They're expecting he should be dead. They're expecting he should take revenge. He should not give us anything. Imagine how many years he could have held a grudge against them. How many years he could have felt disgusted, hatred, anger for his brothers. After all of these years, they have the, the audacity to come in front of his face. And what does Yusuf salam say to them? قَالَ لَا تَثْرِيبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْيَوْمُ My brothers, today there is no blame on you. يَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Allah will forgive you. Not I'm going to forgive you today. Allah will forgive you. وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ And Allah is the most merciful. There are many people in this room. We, there are people we don't talk to anymore. There are people we have blocked. There are people we have cut relations with. We are estranged from family members, cousins, siblings, parents, children sometimes. We don't talk to them anymore. Today is the day we have to resume the conversation. The Prophet ﷺ said in hadith in Musnad al-Darimi, Man qata'a akhahu sanatan kana kasafki dami. Whoever doesn't speak to someone for one year, you avoid your brother for one year, you don't even give him salam, it, you get the sin of killing him. Hadith in Musnad al-Darimi. Whoever avoids, cuts ties with a Muslim for one year, it's like you killed him. You get the sin of killing him. It's, not, it's a very serious thing. Yusuf alayhi salam forgives and he forgets. And at the end of the story, when his parents come and they do sujood in front of him, and the dream he saw as a child comes true. It is at this moment in time that Yusuf alayhi salam expresses something when you achieve something, anything in life, small or big, you have to remember this dua of Yusuf. 
رب قد آتيتني من الملك وعلمتني من تأويل الأحاديث Oh Allah, you have given me this kingdom and you have taught me this interpretation of dreams. فاطر السماوات والأرض أنت ولي في الدنيا والآخرة you created the heavens and the earth. You are my closest companion in this world and in the hereafter. Tawaffani musliman wa alhiqani bisaliheen. O Allah, allow me to die as a Muslim and let my children after me be righteous. This last dua of Yusuf is his note of thanks to Allah. O Allah, you were with me in the well when I struggled. You were with me in the, de- in the desert of Egypt when it was hot. You were with me in the palace when I was oppressed. You are with me in the dark prisons. O oh Allah, you were with me in my good times and my bad times. When I was hungry and when I was fed. When I was alone and when I was in company. O oh Allah, this is the lesson Yusuf learned from his whole life. Everybody in life can come and go. But the only companion who stays with you all the time is one. It is our Lord. Anta waliyi. Oh Allah, you are my closest companion. Everybody else came and they left. They hurt me and they helped me. Except you. Anta waliyi fi dunya wal akhirah. You are my friend, my close one in this world and in the afterlife. Yusuf alayhi salam is in the company of Allah. If we want the difficulties of this world to become easy, we want the darkness of this world to become light, the pressures of this world to become nothing, we have to also be in the constant remembrance of Allah. And with this, we come to the end of reflections from the story of Yusuf. Any mistake is from myself. Anything good is from Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.